Thank you for the privilege. It's wonderful to be here again. It's been a long time. I think we were last year in 2017 or 2018. And then we've had this disrupted period in between. But it's always a privilege. We have a special relationship with Liberty. We love coming back here. It goes back a very long time. Um, and you are a unique church. Um, you know, we've had relationship in Portugal for all those years with a lot of different churches. But there's one or two that have been consistent and, uh, and Liberty is one of them. And this couple, you're very privileged to have them. They, I must tell you... <laughs> We have a lot of fun together. So you send them off and they come back, I'm sure, and give all these report backs. But we laugh a lot. I mean, I've seen Tanya crying with laughter. I don't know if she ever does that here. But we so longed for them to visit us because we, we got the work done. We did what had to be done. They would come and minister and do leadership training and connect with everybody in the church in quite a remarkable way. But in between times, we laughed and laughed and laughed. And for me, that's what the kingdom is about. I mean, for goodness sake, we are the church of the firstborn, the redeemed of the Lord. We have a hope and an eternal future. If we can't celebrate that and have fun and make a whole lot of noise around that, who are we? And, and we have that privilege with them. I, I was thinking about this and I thought, you know, God is a God of technicolor. He's not black and white. Hence, my wife chooses my shirts when I preach. <laughs> In fact, we, we had color days in church because when we first arrived, if there was a breaking of bread, everyone knew when it was coming. They would come in gray suits and ties, the guys. And, and we said, what is this? Just let's rather wear bright colors on that day and celebrate the, the, the colorful God we serve. It's, it's an explosion of color. And I was also thinking about, I don't know if you see them anymore, but when we first arrived in South Africa, there would always be, you'd have to go slowly through a town and there'd be a sign that's saying, church silence. Um, uh, what's it in Afrikaans? Stilta. Kerk huh? Stilta, yeah. So you had to be quiet, but also the church made no noise. You heard nothing. So th that's the scariest thing on earth is a church that makes no noise. We are a noisy people. The kingdom is a noisy and a messy place. And I want to tell you, if you want to bring the harvest in, you've got to get your hands dirty. <laughs> I, I, I grew up um, in my career working on a drawing board with rotting pens. I, I, I drew draw plans. And um, you have to have clean hands to do that. Otherwise, you smudge and you leave dirty marks on the paper. And, and fortunately, it's all CAD now. But in those days, you, you constantly, for me, you constantly keep your hands clean. And I got this phobia about dirty hands. I don't like dirty, sticky hands. But the kingdom requires dirty, sticky hands. We've got to touch each other. We've got to get messy. We've got to, it's noisy. It's going to be noisy in heaven. And I believe we make amazing noise. Uh, uh, Tim uh, spoke about singing the swickle. I don't know the, the words to that song, but yeah. <laughs> Tim, maybe later, eh? And he also spoke about the prophet of the coffee shop. That's someone I'd like to meet. Is it a... <laughs> anyway, never mind. Sorry. Um, let me put this up. Oh, that prophet's going to Lesotho. Okay. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, we've been through some strange times, haven't we? As a church and as a people, we like things in blocks and squares. We don't like our lives to be messed up or, or to become messy. Uh, and yet I believe that God did that. This whole time that we've been through shook us. There was a shaking. And it was for a reason. And I believe, and I really do believe this, it was no surprise for God, was it? Did it take him by surprise and catch him off God like it did us? Of course it didn't. He knew what was coming, and there was a plan and a purpose in that time. Not that we celebrate people who died. I mean, let's face it, we're all going to die. And people died. It was horrible and, and gruesome. And we, I did a funeral of a guy, and it was really, really not very nice. Somebody in our church, it was awful to see the grief that came with that. But COVID didn't take God by surprise. And the church in particular needed some shaking up. The question is why? What was his plan for that? Uh, a, a pastor uh, spoke to me when I was in Portugal and said, uh, oh, this is just such a disaster. We're having to learn to do all these online meetings, and uh, we just miss getting together and being with people, and I just can't wait for it to get back to normal. And I thought, yeah, I agreed with him. And then afterwards I thought, but what is normal? Is that the normal that God intended for the church? I don't think so. I think 
God has brought us into a season of a new normal. And we mustn't hang on to or yearn for things of the past. If we're uncomfortable, it's because He wants us to be uncomfortable. He's shaking us up. He's doing something in the church and in our lives for a reason and for a purpose. He wants to shake us up, doesn't He? I think it's, 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 it's really interesting. And some stuff was flushed out in our church at the time. Um, it's strange what comes out of the woodwork when, when things are unsettled. And so, obviously, end time, people all started rushing around having lots to say, okay? And, uh, yeah, okay, I won't go more down that road. But conspiracy theorists and flat earthers and every kind of weird thing you've ever heard of was promoted. And we had one particular guy, Basson heard me talk about this, who, who just was an, a flat earth evangelist. He went mad. And he was, every opportunity he got, he was telling everybody that the earth is flat and there's proof and the NASA's fake and all the satellite photos have been faked. And he went on and on. And eventually I said to him, okay, let's say it's flat. So what? How does that affect my daily walk with Jesus and my call to tell others about him? How does it affect it? It changes nothing. So we'll get there one day and, and, and God's going to say, oh, I've got bad news for you guys. You were all fooled. The earth is flat. So what? <laughs> what are you doing in terms of what God has called you to do that's making a difference in someone's life besides trying to convince them of this crazy theory, whether it's true or not? And that's true. We can get sidetracked and distracted and go down all these little alleyways. In fact, I think the world today, and you'll agree with me, is a, a world of absolute distraction. Stuff goes on all around us all the time that's distracting. It's very easy to be distracted. It's very easy to, I'm looking at my daughter. <laughs> we love crime series on Netflix. <laughs> Boy, can that stuff suck you in. And, and hey, It really can. I mean, we, we love it. And we're staying with her this week, and we said, can't wait. We're going to get a mug of tea and watch three in a row, you know? That's great, okay? We do need to have fun and be entertained. But that's just one example of, of so much that can distract us. Time on social media and, and all of these things that are around about us. We said the other day, what on earth did we do in our lives before smartphones? Well, we used to read, I suppose. But, but there's this new reality that we're living in. The question is, what does it mean for us as the church? What does it mean for us as individuals? And do we see it as a distraction or a disruption in our lives? Or do we see it as a godly opportunity? God is creating opportunity for us to grow and develop and go forward and advance the kingdom and, and bring in the harvest, all of these things. He's creating a whole new uh, reality uh, for us to do that. And he's, he's shaking off stuff that we don't need. He's shaking off stuff that, that uh, maybe is excess baggage in our lives so that we can get back to the simplicity, cut through the stuff in our lives. And, and let's be honest, the stuff of church. Because I know, I mean, we've been in the ministry for years. You can chase your tail and not keep the main thing the main thing. And what is that? Jesus is the center and the focus of our lives. And walking in relationship with him comes before everything else. Intimacy with God comes before everything else. And we can so easily lose it in the busyness of everything we have to do. Every time I, I, I look at Deanie, she's running around after somebody. She's got something in her hand. and she, Okay, I'm not, sorry. <laughs> but you know what I mean. We get really, really busy. Natty in a pond, you, you never saw her. I mean, she was always somewhere doing something. And the church can consume us in that aspect. We can get really busy and lose sight of what the main thing is. And so essentially what I'm trying to say is we need to trust God through this season to bring clarity, to, for us to open our eyes and see clearly what it is he has for us, who he, he is for us, what our role is. Um, what he wants of us, and, and more importantly, to bring us back to the essence of what it is to be a believer. I had this, um, Natty and I were praying in the car on our way here yesterday, and I just had this, this picture come to mind, this story in the Bible. I'll read it to you from Mark 8, um, and I'll read it from the message. Mark 8, 22. They arrived at Bethsaida. Some people brought a sightless man and begged Jesus to give him a healing touch. Taking him by the hand, he led him out of the village. He put spit in the man's eyes, laid hands on him, and asked, do you see anything? Okay, now that's a really important question for us. Do you see anything? Are your eyes open? He looked up. I see men, and they look like walking trees. 
And um, the, the NIV says so they look like trees walking around, okay? They look like walking trees. So Jesus laid hands on his eyes again, the only time Jesus ever repeated a healing, okay? He laid hands on him again. The man looked hard and realized that he had recovered perfect sight. He saw everything in bright 2020 focus. Jesus sent him straight home, telling him, don't enter the village. How beautiful is that? He saw in bright 2020 focus. And I think that crystallizing of our vision, the clarity of vision, is what God wants us to have coming out of all of this time of disruption. He wants to enable us to see clearly and to see through the, the murk and the, the, the mess of all of the stuff that's been happening in all of our lives and all of this confusion. So we came out of this COVID time, us as a church in Portugal, and we said, okay, God is saying that to us. He wants us to see clearly. What is it that he wants us to see? Let's take a step back and say, okay, it's been an unusual time, to, to, to put it mildly. What does he want of us? What does he want us to see? And so we took time out, and it took us, jish, four months maybe, of meeting regularly, praying, making notes. And, and I think we arrived at the conclusion very early on, but we wanted to actually condense it into a very simple way to put to the church. So our question was, we, we, we came to a question and said, okay, what is the question we need to ask ourselves? And the question was, what is a healthy church? What is a successful church? Because you see all of these expressions of church, and in Portugal it's from one extreme to the other, bearing in mind it's 98% Catholic, but there's from the Catholic Church to the Evangelical Church and all of the different expressions of Evangelical Church, especially there at the moment is the hyper-prosperity, hyper-grace, and hyper-faith movement, which is taking over, okay? And for me, that produces disciples, uh, uh, believers who are an inch deep and a mile wide. They, they're not very, very deep in their, in their walk with God. But anyway, that's, uh, I don't want to criticize, but that's what we see. So we're saying, okay, what is the mark that we want to apply to ourselves for what a healthy church should look like? And then what are we going to go about doing to put that in place? And our um, conclusion, well, it's not numbers, is it? We heard Grant say that yesterday. You can have a big church that's unhealthy, that's, that's not successful. And you can have small churches that are not successful and vice versa. So it's not numbers or buildings or money or programs, or ministries, or any of those other things. That is not the mark of a healthy church. And we can get so focused on those things that we can lose our perspective. Those are all necessary things. Don't get me wrong. We need buildings and ministries and money and all of those things. But those are not the essence of what a healthy church looks like. What it is in a nutshell, and this is our conclusion, is doing intentionally well at what Jesus told us to do while being who Jesus wants us to be. Now, that might sound quite vague, but actually, let's think about that. The two essential elements of that statement are Jesus is the head, the center, and the focus of a people who love God and love each other. So then you've got to figure out how to work that out, don't you? But Jesus must be the center. It's all about him. It's all about him at the end of the day. That's what matters above everything else. Jesus at the center. And we've heard that over this last week, over and over and over again. Fix your eyes on Jesus. It's about Jesus at, in first place, okay? And then the second thing is being disciples who make disciples. That's what he told us to do. Being disciples who make disciples. It's, it's the great commission and the great commandment tied up together. And we, we just came back to that conclusion. And we went, first of all, we thought, well, why did it take us so long? But we really tried to sort through the fluff and get back to that. And that's what the essential is. So all of the fundament, fundamental aspects of church life, our calling, our commission, uh, what we get busy with in the church, our personal walk with Christ are summed up in those two statements. And importantly, being prepared for the harvest, if, if we know that it's around us all the time and we need to play a part in that, those two things need to be in place first in our lives. So you can minister, you can have a calling, you can have giftings. If those two things in, are not in place, they won't be effective. They can't be. You have to have Jesus as the center of your life. Otherwise, it's religion. 
we so easily fall into religion. And we can, we can criticize the religious, but we so easily become religious ourselves. Just repetitively doing something because that's what we do. Without bearing in mind who we do it for and why we do it, we've got to be reminded of that. We've got to come back to that. And these last few years have shaken us and reminded of us of that. And I think it's really essential. It's not rocket science. I saw a guy yesterday with a t-shirt, I think, saying it is rocket science. But anyway... <laughs> It's not rocket science. It's pretty basic, but these elements have to be in place. So let's look at the second part of that. This is where we were really going, is being disciples who make disciples. And Marcus came to visit us halfway through all this, and he said, you know what? Because we were talking about this and preaching about it, and, and we went down this long road of preaching about being disciples. And Marcus said, everywhere I go, God is saying the same, things in, same thing to the churches. Bring it back to this essential element. We're called to make disciples. How are we doing that? How's the church fulfilling that? Well, I want to say, to make disciples, first and foremost, we have to be disciples. Okay, you can't not be a disciple and make disciples. You're going to end up with some strange hybrid Frankenstein character, which is not really what God wants us to do, you know? Flip the switch and say, it's alive! But meanwhile, it's a strange kind of zombie. And that happens. So we're not called to make zombies. We call to be disciples who make disciples. So Jesus says in Matthew 28, and you're all familiar with it, therefore go. What does he say? Therefore go and plant churches in all nations. Did he say that? Huh? Therefore go and have wonderful coffee shops in every church. <laughs> therefore go and appoint decor teams in every group of people that gather. No, th those things are great. I love churches with coffee shops and great decor. This is so, so cool. But he says, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples. That's what he told us to do. The last thing he said. So I think he meant it. And he said, make disciples of nations, all nations. But you can't disciple a nation. I mean, I, I haven't landed yet. I'm here to disciple South Africa. It's nonsensical. It starts with people. It has to be individuals. It's one by one by one by one by one by one. That's how we make disciples. And hopefully then we end up with a nation who's disciples. But we have to start somewhere. We ha we may if we call to make disciples, where do we start? So this is something else we focused on a lot. And it might seem simplistic and a bit silly, but just hear me out. What is a disciple? And Linu, who I handed the church over to, a, a son in the house, came up through the ranks uh, just a, a newly saved guy in the church, uh, an accountant, in fact, an auditor, a professional, really good young guy. He and I, in some ways, could not be more different. We've, we're similar in many ways, but I mean, I, I'm a designer. He's an auditor. So he's very blocks and squares. The first meeting we had um, to discuss when we first landed in Portugal, him and the other guy who led the youth got us together and said, okay, we're going to have a dinner at my mom's house, and we're going to sit around the table, and we're going to talk about our plans for the youth. And each of us had a notepad with a pencil, a glass, a bottle of water, and he had an organogram on the wall. <laughs> and I let him talk, and he went on about how all of these things would link, and who, who linked here, and whatever. And then I said, you know, that's great corporate stuff, but the church is a family. You know, we don't work like that. And to this day, he laughs about it. But that's, that's his, his mindset. But he's very thorough. So he said, okay, we can, we, this is what God is saying to us. Let's define a disciple. What is a disciple? And that was a really good move because I'd never thought about it before. What do you guys, have you thought about it? Okay, so we have the example of Jesus' disciples. That's, it's a great example in the Bible. But actually, let's try to define this. If we're going to make something, we need to know what we're doing, don't we? So you're going to, you call to, to make a cake. You, you need a recipe, and you need those ingredients, and you need to know how to put them together. So I think that's, that's quite an important thing. So in the biblical definition is someone who is a follower or student of something else, a person or a movement or an idea or a concept. So you can be a disciple. I use the example, a disciple of Mahatma Gandhi, and then he had a lot of disciples. Or you could be a disciple of communism. So you really believe in that thing, and you sold out for it. But... In, to, in the biblical sense, um, it says one who accepts and insists in spreading the doctrines of another, such as in Christianity. So you don't only accept that, but you spread it. You, you take it into yourself. You accept it and you believe in it, but you export it. And that's what being disciples who make disciples is all about. We export Christ. 
We, let, we make Christ known. So knowing Christ and making him known is that aspect of discipleship. And I think that's not a complete de- definition either because you can be a Christian with degrees in theology and not be a disciple. Does that make sense? You can have it all up here. But to start, being a disciple is much more than having it all up here. And I think we can fall into the trap of being followers of Christ but not disciples of Christ. And that's very clear in the New Testament. Multitudes followed Jesus. They all ran away when the pressure came. Who stayed the course? The disciples. So what defined them? What was the difference between a disciple and a follower? And I think this is essential for you individually sitting here today. Because in going through this process, we were forced to do a self-assessment and check these boxes. Actually, you know what? I haven't been like that for a long time. I've got to get back to what is important in my life. I've got to get back in line with what Jesus expects of me, with, with who I should be if I truly am a disciple of Christ. And I'm called to be this person who makes other disciples. Because you can't make disciples if you're a follower. So follower is somebody who's interested and is there. And I think the church can be full of followers. So they pitch up, you're interested. You're part of this thing. You're there week after week. You, you, you listen. But in the, the essence of a follower church is that it's a church of spectators. Disciples practice. Followers watch. So they watched Jesus, and they were there for something. He healed them, and they loved it. And they came in the multitudes to hear what he had to say. But the followers fell away. Fortunately, I think some of them came back later when the penny dropped, but they fell away. So you want to be a disciple. How does it start? What is the key element to being a disciple? And I think this is the most important thing of all. And I'm running out of time. The the most important thing for me is having a revelation of Christ. Revelation is the key to the lock of being a true believer, of being a disciple of Christ. I don't believe you can be without a revelation. And so um, I've got some examples. And that that, that came out, we heard Tyron say a, a week ago, I don't know if it was in Job or in PE, he said, The central thing for us is a revelation of Christ. You have to have a revelation of who Jesus is. Anyway, so that's the starting point. That's the light bulb moment. What turns an unsaved person into a believer who is a disciple? It's a revelation of Jesus. You can't be saved without it, okay? So I want to give this example in in 1 Samuel. I love this story. And we have the story of this young boy, Samuel, who's in the temple ministering before the Lord under Eli. I'm sure you all know the story in 1 Samuel chapter 3. I don't have too much time, so I'm going to skim through it. But it says, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. So he was lying next to the ark. Can you imagine that? eh? And this is a boy. Then the Lord called Samuel. Called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. So he went back and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. My son, Eli, said, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. Now, this is the key verse, verse 7. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So he he had no knowledge of God. He had no relationship with God. He hadn't had a revelation of God, okay? The third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling out as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. I think that's such a wonderful thing. He, He heard God and he had this encounter with God and a revelation, a personal revelation of God that set him on course to be the prophet Samuel. And what an incredible story. But it says further on in verse 19 to 21, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. So revelation, light bulb moment, 
It's recognizing who God is, recognizing Jesus for who He is. Being born again by the Spirit of God comes from revelation, doesn't it? Flesh and blood has not revealed to this to you, but my Father in heaven. Jesus said to, to, to Peter, it's, it's a spiritual revelation. It's something you can't manufacture, but you have to have it. So Samuel, then, then there's progressive revelation. We walk in revelation. We seek it. It comes through intimacy with God. So we have to have fresh revelation. Jesus said, remain in me and I will remain in you. So we, that's our sustenance that comes from the vine, isn't it? And that's, that's revelation. So we can read his word as ink on paper and understand interesting Bible stories and put together this whole theology of church and life and everything else. But there has to be ongoing revelation. We have to have this penny that drops, and it can drop every day. How many of you read a passage of Scripture and have read it many times over years, and one day you'll pick it up and think, what? I've never seen that here before. Or somebody will stand up and preach from a passage. And say, How can I be such a fool? He's opened that passage up, and there's such a gem of truth in that thing that I've never recognized before. That's revelation. That's revelation. Uh, he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. It's the revelation that comes through reading the word of God. So we have to do that. We have to have that ongoing revelation. And that pattern is consistent throughout the New Testament. Light bulb moment, ongoing revelation. And they all had it. What turned a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors into people who gave their lives for Jesus? But they didn't do it because they were followers or, or through a sense of duty or whatever else. They had a revelation of who he was. And, and those examples are incredible. So uh, Nicodemus being born again by the Spirit of God. Jesus said, you must be born again. And that's a spiritual thing, okay? And it, it can't happen unless the Father draws us. And then Peter, when, when he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The others probably all recognized that and sat there with a mouthful of teeth, not knowing what to say. But Peter stood up and said, that's who you are. And that moment, that precise declaration is what every one of us needs to have. If you are born again, you have to have come to this conclusion. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. For yourself, not because somebody else is talking about it. We, we have an interesting way that we, we developed in leading people to God in, in, in Portugal because with a Catholic mindset, and all of them come from that Catholic worldview of God, and you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they, have a, they have a different perspective. And we found that that, that penny-dropping moment, that light bulb moment, is absolutely essential for them. So for us to say, you liked what's said in the message, God has convicted you, come up here and say a prayer, did not work. So many of those people would stay for a few weeks and fall away and say, you know what, this new religion hasn't given me what I've been expecting and it's not solving the problems in my life and whatever. So you know the story. We, we started saying to people, okay, here's a Bible. We gave them a Bible. Go and read John. Start in John chapter 1. Don't start in John. Start in John chapter 1. Open it and say, if you are real, Jesus, reveal yourself to me. And we just leave them. And sometimes, how's it going? They'd come to church and they'd say, wow, I don't understand this. This is so interesting, whatever. And we had people coming and saying, I'm ready. I want to give my life to this Jesus. He's spoken to me. He's revealed himself to me. And it happened in remarkable ways. So it's not something you can rush. We had to wait for them to get to that place where they could say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to lay my life at your feet. And those people, you know some of those examples. It's just mind-blowing, and we've had a lot more since. And we met a guy in Neisner who came from Joburg and did men's retreats. And he said, I don't know how to lead a church. I don't know what to do, but I really feel the businessmen that I work with need to have an encounter with God. So he booked in the Michalisburg a couple of men's retreats, and he said, these guys didn't know what they were getting into. So they'd rock up three or four or five men for this men's retreat. He'd give them a Bible, and this just blew us away. And he'd say, go sit under a tree. I don't have anything to say to you. Go sit under a tree. God wants to speak to you. And the same thing. And he said these businessmen would come back with tear-stained faces and say, I didn't know God could speak to you. I just had something happen to me out there. I have to know more. I, I get all emotional with that. Isn't that incredible? Friends, God wants to speak to us. We have to open the door. And that, that is such an essential thing. It's not a once-off, it's an ongoing speaking, speaking, speaking. And we need to say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I'm here, I want to hear more. I want to know more. So, you know, um, in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. There's this drawing that the Father always wants. He wants to keep us close to his Son. That's who Jesus is to us. Um, 
and then, you know, this, the, 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 the followers all turning away, and Jesus says to his disciples, you guys want to go too? And they say, um, who else can we go to? It's you who have the words of eternal life. There's no other option. We now know that it's you. There's nowhere else to go. There's no one else to turn to. Nothing else will fulfill that need. You have the words of life. We can stay with you. And they did, didn't they? And then Thomas, good old Thomas, when Jesus appears and he says, yeah, stick your finger in the hole in my side and, and, and in, in the holes in my hands. And what does Thomas say? My Lord and my God. So now he was not just the rabbi. My Lord and my God. What a declaration. The light bulb, the, the, the light exploded in his life and, and uh, made all the difference. And then Paul, I mean, I, I, I think I need to move on from this, but Paul had this moment on the road to Damascus where it was literally a blinding light, and he had this encounter with Jesus. But Paul had this incredible capacity to have ongoing revelation. So it says in, in Galatians 1.16, I received the gospel by a revelation of Jesus Christ, who by revelation uh, uh, was, re was pleased to reveal his son in me. I'm paraphrasing this, okay? That God was pleased to reveal his son in Paul. And then later he says, I want to know Christ. So didn't he know Jesus at that point? No, because he wanted to carry on knowing him. We can never get to the end of Jesus. We can never get to the end of knowing Christ. We will always develop in our knowledge of Christ. And then it says later on, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation. So after 14 years, he had another revelation, which was the gospel is for the Gentiles. And that, that's why we're sitting here today. If Paul didn't have that revelation, where would we be today? God used Paul to bring the revelation to the Gentiles. And all the Gentiles on the face of the earth who have the gospel, it's through that revelation. So we have to have that. That's, that's the key of what I'm trying to bring across to you today. Hunger and thirst for more of God. And it comes through intimacy. We have to seek Him. And He says, when we seek Him, we will find Him. So there's a, there's a there's this sense that we have to get up and go for it. The church is not all about what happens on a Sunday. This is the half time in the game. We come here for the coach to to give us some coaching, and to hear some good advice about how we need to get out there and play the game. The game is out there. Our Christianity and us being the church is actually more about out there than it is in here. So we have this strange sense that I'm going, to, I'm going to church, and that's the limit of my Christianity. But what about in the week, feeding yourself, reading the Word, seeking revelation, growing in your knowledge of God, all of those things. That way you will, become, you will not be ineffective and useless and God will be able to use you. You'll become an effective believer. In effect, you'll become a disciple. And that's, it, it's all the stuff working together, the Sundays, the leaders, the home groups, the leadership training, uh, the Bible school, all of that stuff works together to make us disciples. But anyway, I need to close this. How much? Six minutes, eh? Okay. I've said enough about Revelation. But you guys get it? So now, tick box. How is my state of revelation of God in my life? Have, am I having fresh revelation? Uh, sadly, we have um, encountered many people who, had, who were born again maybe in the 80s and had this incredible revelation of God and gave their lives and were sold out and have never had a revelation since. They're living on very old revelation. And it often comes out in their language, the way they talk and all of that. They're stuck in the past. They've never moved on. And that's a sad thing. So let's, let's look at this. What does Jesus himself say? You are his disciple. How does he describe you? Okay? What does Jesus say? I mean, the, the New Testament is full of all of these uh, indicators of what a disciple is. It's full of stories of the disciples being disciples and going out and do, doing disciple things, uh, discipling and walking around. And all that stuff. But Jesus says four things. I, I read through this and I identified four things that come straight from the mouth of Jesus. There are four marks of a disciple that need to be evident and active in your life. Okay? Love, obedience, sacrifice, and fruit. As simple as that. So love, which is the mark of that deep relationship with God. You can't love your brother if you don't love God. You have to. There's got to be... This love, of, love for God in you so that you can express that in love for one another. He said in 1 John 1, 3, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us, intimacy with God. And our fellowship is with the Father 
and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So there's the starting point. Fellowship with God. Intimacy with God. And then he says in John 13, 34 to 35, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, in other words, that intimacy, as I have loved you, and we know that intimacy, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So by this. So how is everybody out there going to know that we are disciples of Christ? Because we love each other. We can say, oh, I love God. I'm so in love with Jesus. It means nothing to anybody. Huh? We just become another spooky weirdo who's sprouting some stuff. R really, to somebody who's not interested, what does that mean? But if they see how we are with each other, not biting and devouring each other, or in conflict and bickering and in competition and all of that stuff that happens in church, but by our genuine love for one another, caring for each other and loving one another, that's the mark for Jesus of how the people out there will know that we belong to him, that we are his disciples and not his followers. Make sense? The second one is obedience, which is the mark of our love for God and the mark of a, an ongoing living relationship with Him. I'm doing these briefly, but obviously you can really develop on each of these themes, okay? But I'll, I'll, I'll bring it to a close with this. John 8, 31 to 32. To the Jews who had believed Him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Okay, so once again, he's making a statement about who you are. Are you my disciples? Hold to my teaching. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Isn't that amazing that those things are linked together? You want to know the truth about God? Obey what he says. Jesus replied in John 14, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. It's all linked, love and obedience. You love him. Why aren't you doing what he tells you to do? How are you living this life and claiming to love God at the same time? Being at church and claiming to love God but not doing what he says is hypocrisy. And that's the, the rightfully so, the accusation that's leveled at the evangelical church in Portugal all the time. A bunch of hypocrites. It's really, and it's hard to hear it. But we have to uh, look at each other and say, well, are they right? And many, many times they are. Because the testimony of Christians in the world can be absolutely shockingly bad. Uh, we've seen so much stuff. I won't go into it. But you know what I'm saying? If you love me, do what I say. Then you are really my disciples. Huh? It's simple. Disciples obey. Disciples love and disciples obey. The third one is sacrifice. Now, it starts to get difficult at this point. So it's a mark of a change in our priorities and a willingness to actually lay down our lives. A willingness to be vulnerable and to put our priorities aside and say, okay, I want to be your disciple. When things get hard, I'm not going to run away. If things get hard, I'm going to stay the course. And it's a conscious decision we have to make. But it's, it, it comes more easily if we have Christ in our hearts. If the Holy Spirit is within us, He will empower us to do that. So Jesus says in Matthew 16, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. This thing about taking up your cross, wow, it's, it's not funny. He calls us to suffer. We, are, we always say, he hasn't called us to a picnic in a field of daisies. Part of our Christian walk can be that, and yes, there are lovely times in the church of fun, and they need to be, and all of that, but there is an aspect to it where at some point we will be called to pay the price. And if you want to be his disciple, come to terms with it. It's going to happen. It's difficult. In um, Luke 14, it says, large, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, if anyone, now this is getting harder, eh? if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. How much more specific can he get? Now we're starting to get into really hard stuff. So if he calls you and you say, okay, here I am, send me, watch out. We personally have been through that. Sorry, B. <laughs> we personally have been through that. Where God called us and we went to another country. Now Natty's crying. Sorry, babe. And we thought, oh, well, they'll probably come over there and join us and it'll all be hunky-dory and we'll be a family again and they'll learn to love Portugal and live there. And they both found, and here's one of them sitting here, they both found their partners here and stayed here. And the grandkids were born here. So I, I have personal experience of this. And let me tell you, it's hard. It's not funny. 
So, yeah, what do you do? You stay the course. You, you, you do what Jesus said. You have to hate even your own life and put that, those things on the line, and it's very hard. And in verse 33, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be, be my disciples. So I'm sorry this is not a really good news thing for you guys here today. But let's come back to the reality of what God is trying to say. Is he shaking things? Absolutely. He's shaking off the excess and he's bringing back, us back to the essence of what it really means. You want to be a disciple? That's what he says. It's tough stuff. And then number four, fruit. So you have roots in Christ. You love, obey, and lay down your life. It will be visible. There'll be fruit in your life. There cannot not be fruit in your life because you're connected to the vine. God is working in and through you. There's going to be something visible in your life. And it's not all, well, I'm, I've planted a church or I've done this or done that. For every one of us, it's different. And it can happen in small ways. It might not even be noticed very readily, but you'll be, have a fruitful life. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So once again, back to intimacy, back to relationship, back to those core things I said in the beginning. Jesus is the center and focus and walking in intimacy and relationship with him. This is to my Father's glory in John 15 again, uh, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Again, showing yourselves. The evidence is in the fruit. Uh, uh, so I, I just think it's an amazingly beautiful picture, a fruitful life. In Christ, it comes from being a disciple and not just a follower. Uh, these things have to be, they must be ticked in our boxes. And if they're not, we've got to say to ourselves, why? What can I do to turn this thing around and make this a reality in my life? So in summary, we live in revelation. We have a revelation and we live in revelation that leads to a transformed life. And that transformed life will result in love, obedience, sacrifice, and fruit. That's a su simple summary. Does it make sense? I hope so. So that's what God told us there. I know without a shadow of a doubt, it's what he's telling everybody everywhere. Wherever we go, elements of this are popping up in all of these preachers all the time. And I keep nudging her and saying, wow, you know, here we are again about revelation. Here we are again about obedience. Here we are, are again about putting Jesus at the center, about fixing our eyes on him. It's about him and only him. And all of that stuff just keeps coming up. God is speaking to us. He wants us to open our eyes and see clearly. And that process involves change in us. It involves change in the church. We cannot stay the same because he doesn't want us to. And so to close, I want to um, read this from Ephesians 1, 70 to 21. And it's Paul praying for the Ephesians. And I think it's, um, it's such a beautiful passage. He says, I keep asking. I ask and I ask and I ask again. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Isn't that beautiful? He, it's, it's not, I've asked 20 years ago and he gave it to you and so we all hunky-dory here. I keep asking. Give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart, in other words, your spiritual vision, may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Well, how much better could we summarize it, eh? This incredible Jesus who we serve, we want to know him better. And we want to open the eyes of our heart to know him better. Amen.